One of the longest battles of the Second World War was the Battle of Stalingrad, lasting five months, one week and three days. The Eastern Front was a war zone between Nazi Germany and its allies and the Soviet Union. The Battle of Stalingrad is recognised as being amongst the bloodiest battles ever fought in the history of warfare, and in 1993 an anti-war film directed by Joseph Vilsmeyer was released which depicted the battle and its aftermath from the German perspective. And it's this film that I'm going to discuss in today's episode of Nightmare Fuel where as per there will be major spoilers ahead. You have been warned. I have previously covered anti-war films on the channel such as multiple versions of All Quiet on the Western Front. There the German perspective of World War One is told. I think that the characters there are likeable and personable from very early on, in a way where the perceived line between their evil and their humanity is blurred very quickly. However, with Stalingrad, they go for a different approach, where in a lot of the German soldiers are shown at first to be pretty dislikable. When it comes to adaptations of Nazi soldiers in film, at least in films made by countries who fought against the Nazis, they are often presented in a way where they are cruel arrogant and mindless, almost caricatures in a way, slightly exaggerating their evil nature despite people like that existing in real life. I think that the introduction segment of Stalingrad at points leads you down that path of expectancy. While on leave in Italy after taking part in the first battle of El Alamein, these German soldiers are loud, obnoxious and crude, with my initial reaction being that I found them generally dislikable. When they pass field workers while on a train passing over the Eastern Front, the soldiers mock the workers, that they now work for them. These are innocent people whose lives have been compromised by the war, yet here to the Germans, they're all individual butts of jokes. Their sweat and suffering are cannon fodder for hilarity here. The presentation of these soldiers in these opening segments quickly made me sink into that feeling of them being the same pompous and spiteful men seen in a lot of cinematic representations of the German forces. However, one of the succinct strengths of Stalingrad is that over time you see these men become hardened by the war, getting a truthful insight into the mindset of their superior officers, and ultimately wanting to rebel against the Nazi system. Their eyes become widened to the reality of what cause they are fighting for and they want out. That is a tough to swallow lesson learned the hard way, with Stalingrad putting these men through their paces, breaking them down and dwindling their numbers until nothing remains. This film is an unforgiving viewing experience, with the grisly physical and mental effects being put on full display with relentless clarity. And all of this comes from the men being sent into Stalingrad. The reason some of these men are selected is because they were the best. Immediately this made me feel a bit of sorrow. The better the soldier you are, the more you're going to endure. Your reward for doing your job properly is to get thrown into even more chaos. But it should be fine, as one soldier thinks the Germans will take Stalingrad in three days. Oh, how wrong he was. When we get propelled into the Battle of Stalingrad, it's a sickeningly raw experience. The handheld camera work feels frantic, immersing you in the destruction. But despite the explosions and the bullets, the real heartache of the battle comes from the reactions and interactions of the soldiers. Take for example the fact that when certain men are killed, they are mourned by name. Identities are shouted out loud, the pain and the suffering drowning out the artillery. It makes each soldier feel unique and important. So important that when a German soldier accidentally kills one of his own men via friend fire, he begs that he should be killed, that in effect he doesn't deserve to live. His guilt in this moment is enough for him to want to suddenly end it all and pay his penalty. But what encouraging suggestion is made to the soldier in order to get better? 
Kill some Russians. That's the medicine. The answer to killing the wrong person is to kill the right people. This sickened me. A proper fight fire with fire mentality, where the only way to make yourself better is to get revenge. This mentality hit me hard in this particular moment, and it also tied into something said earlier in the battle, where some of the German artillery strikes come close to hitting German troops. It's said that the artillery isn't known for accuracy. The implication here, linking to the friendly fire concept of making me wonder just how many people were killed during the war because of inaccurate weaponry. That thought sat deep in my gut for the remainder of the battle. But this isn't even the worst part of the battle. One soldier falls into a crater and becomes frozen with fear. Attempts are made to keep the soldier moving, otherwise he'll die. He stays put, but is almost immediately blown up. What reaction does this garner from the man who tried to help him? I told you so, idiot. This man has just been in the most frightened state he's ever been in in his entire life and has died a horrific death. Yet there's zero respect or remorse. It was his own stupid fault. Yet again, limiting the importance of life during times of war. In another shocking scene, we see a soldier named Feldman run out towards an enemy foxhole, blowing it up with a hand grenade, but being shot down in the process. Why, you ask? Because Feldman owed his squad one. Earlier, while the Germans advance on a factory they want to claim, Feldman accidentally triggers his rifle and gives away their position to the enemy. It's Feldman's error which kicks off the conflict and costs many German lives. Now he has to pay for his mistake with his life in order for the German advance to continue. All those lives lost and one further sacrificed, all from one accidental bullet. The battle's casualties become so large that each side agrees a temporary ceasefire so that the dead can be gathered. During this quiet period, we get some haunting lines from the film's predominant soldier, Fritz. When speaking with a crying soldier named Gigi, Fritz comforts him by saying that he should be glad he can still cry. This line shattered me. The countless dead have no ability to do anything, so even crying is a better state to be in than those who have perished in the fight. Another chilling line comes from when Fritz is asked if he thinks about everything that has happened, to which he replies, if you start thinking, you go crazy. So I don't. Literally, ignorance is bliss. If you want to persevere, you cannot let your emotions and self-reflection get the better of you. You have to shut it all out in order to have a better chance of survival. In effect, you have to forcefully rid yourself of your compassion and your humanity. This was a really impactful scene. The ceasefire is soon broken and the men flee into the sewers to escape. It's while in these sewers that we see even more victims of the battle. A mother cradling her children, one of which cries in distress. When you see war's grasp take a hold of innocent children, that makes my soul sink. We even see it later when, in an exchange of information for bread, an old man who provided the Germans with the information passes the small chunk of bread back to a child. I can honestly say that anything war-related involving children suffering at the hands of men deeply saddens me, and Stalingrad's use of this is no exception to that rule. When the men eventually get to an aid station, we are presented with a room full of wounded men, their blood and body parts being contorted and in desperate need of treatment. The agony echoes across this rough ocean of mangled flesh as whimpers and groans become a disjointed symphony in the film's sound design. Amputations and slapdash surgeries taking place wherever possible. It's certainly a scene that will get the better of the queasy. After the death of Emigolt, the men are arrested by the despicable German Captain Haller, who has previously given von Witzland a rough time from his caring for Soviet prisoners. Their punishment is to be redistributed to a landmine deactivation unit, wherein they endure a bloody battle in the snow against a tank column. Here we get the most graphic image in the film of a soldier whose legs have been blown completely off. His upper body rests on the snow. He screams in pain next to his legs until dying suddenly. That was a brutal one to take in. 
This battle in general displays clearly what kind of damage only a small handful of tanks are capable of, with some horrific body horror included. In fact, the body horror overall in the film isn't very pleasant at all. I've already spoken about the amputations being done in the aid station, but later we even see Musk suffering from trench foot, with his skin being completely blackened. It's horrendous. Great practical effects from a filmmaking standpoint, but the idea that in war there's so many things out there that can cripple you beyond weaponry is a bleak concept. After this battle comes perhaps the most gut-wrenching scene in the film, wherein the men are forced by Haller to execute Soviet prisoners, including a young Russian cobbler boy named Kolya. Kolya helped the squad during the Battle of Stalingrad, and the squad befriended him. However, Haller doesn't care about that. He's Russian, he's the enemy, doesn't matter what he did for the Germans, or that he's a boy shoot him. And so, that's what happens, with Fritz having to not only take down the boy, but prove to Haller that he fired his rifle. Not that it would have mattered, as the bodies are shot in the head with a pistol, just to make sure. Having covered a lot of war films on the channel, I can unquestionably say that this scene is right up there with the grimmest of experiences I've had as a content creator. Haller is ultimately killed by Otto, but even that doesn't right the wrong. Haller's death doesn't heal the wounds inflicted before, nor does any vengeful death. In the context of the film, their execution of the prisoners is enough for the men to desert the war effort. They no longer want to fight for the country who forced them to kill innocent people. Thus, they pretend to be wounded using medical tags they find on dead bodies, but they miss the flight out the country, reuniting with and killing Haller, and then it's off to Haller's house. Here we get to see these people finally reflect on the hell they've endured to get to this point. It's enough to make Otto shoot himself, no longer wanting to live with the constant black clouds surrounding him. It all goes goes back to war not only putting your death in the hands of others, but it can also possess you into taking yourself. Sad, yet true. And as we see the final members of our squad being picked off by the Soviets and the frozen landscape, we see the results of a horrendous period in history. All of those initially dislikable men became aware of the underworld they fell into, and saw the corrupt puppeteers for exactly what they were. They stood up to the system and wanted to escape, yet the only escape for them all was death. 1993's Stalingrad has a cult following, and with good reason, giving us an idea of one of history's bloodiest battles and what its survivors had to endure makes this an unforgettable experience, and one of the finest anti-war films ever made. Thank you very much for watching this edition of Nightmare Fuel, I've been Connor from Unleash the Ghouls, and remember, war settles nothing. Cheers.